I'm not going to do it. Jack, tell me not to do it. Don't do it. I'm, I, I shouldn't do it. Hello! <laughs> What's going on, everybody? Welcome back to the Scandy Sports Podcast. Today, we have a special, special guest. If you're watching on YouTube, you see him. He's right there. You know who that is. But before we get into it, thescandysports.com slash merch. Get yourself a t-shirt. Jack, you know, that my shirt's okay, right? It's a nice shirt. Looks really nice, and you did a pretty good hello there. I like it. Oh, not too bad, right? Not too bad. <laughs> hey, maybe I'll airdrop you one of these old-fashioned way at tomorrow's game from the 300s. I'll just, I'll just drop you one down. What I like think? it. Hey, there's no nation like donation, Andrew. Exactly. Um, so let's get right into it. Jack, I actually wanted to start with energy. Every single time you're on a broadcast, so much energy. You have always very positive and you're ready to go. Where where do you draw your energy from? I've never seen you have an off night. Uh, I have a love affair with the game. I would honestly say I think that's probably it. I love I love basketball. I've loved it since I was seven years old, starting playing. And uh, here I am 51 years later and I still have a love affair with it. So uh, how do you not show enthusiasm and passion for something you really care about deeply? Uh, so to me, you know, from playing to coaching to now broadcasting, uh, I've always loved the game. The game has given me so much in my life. And uh, the least I could do is give back to it. Right. And uh, so to me, I just think it's a it's a natural thing of like when you get in the gym and you start hanging out with basketball people. And you, you, and then the game starts and you start talking about it. I mean, why wouldn't you? I mean, it's just, it's what we do. It's, it's our, it's our life's calling. And, uh, you know, just like, uh, you know, when you, uh, when you hear a, a great musician talk about their music uh, or someone in art, uh, someone in law, someone in medicine, whatever the case may be, something you have a, a, a real passion about. Uh, I think that, that that's your calling in life. That's what you love. And uh, so to me, I'm like, that's what I do. That's what I love. Uh, you know, and, and uh, I'm, I'm glad to be doing it and I enjoy it. And I, I, I appreciate every day I do it. So you went from, uh, you went into broadcasting out of coaching. Did you think broadcasting was going to be like a bridge back to coaching or what was, uh, what was the dynamic there? No, I absolutely thought it was going to be a bridge. Andrew, I, I, I honestly had no interest in, in being in broadcasting. Um, when I left uh, Niagara university in 1998, uh, you know, in my last few years as a coach, a lot of people said, man, you'd be great on TV radio. You know, you're so cool. You know, you, when I was a coach, I had my own TV show, own radio show, and obviously you're interviewed a lot uh, by the media. And I was always comfortable in front of the camera and always comfortable in front of a mic. Uh, I don't know if that's good or bad, but I was. <laughs> uh, and a lot of people encouraged me that, hey, you know, if you ever. So I think they were kind of, it was kind of like code word for saying, you know what, you're a pretty lousy coach. You'd probably be better on TV radio than you are on the sidelines. Well, you know what? Uh, so I have my master's in communications from Fordham University, and I have my bachelor's from Fordham in history. And I got my master's in communications at Fordham. And the only reason I got it was that, hey, they said, hey, we'll pay for your master's. And I'm like, all right, I got to find something to do uh, that, that'll fit our practice time. And I'm like, wow, you know, a few of our players were majoring in communications. I used to run study hall when I was an assistant coach. So you sit in the library with these guys. They're like, man, I like this communications I'm taking. I'm like, cool. So I asked them, I'm like, you think I'd enjoy it? They're like, oh, yeah, you'd love it. So I, I went and got my master's in it, never thinking in a million years that I'd ever use it. Uh, and honestly, with, with all due respect to Fordham, and I love Fordham dearly, uh, I can't remember 99.9% .9 of the stuff I learned in grad school uh, because I was so obsessed with coaching, you know. Uh, but nonetheless, people. Here I am now uh, in my 24th year, <laughs> excuse me, in uh, broadcasting. And uh, I kind of fell into it. I thought I'd do it for a year. I had a year left on my contract at Niagara. 
And I just felt like, hey, I was burnt out. I was going to get paid for another year. And, uh, I'm gonna, you know, I'm going to keep myself afloat and in the public eye. And I, was, I got hired by the Raptors to be the radio analyst with uh, Chuck Swirsky. On, uh, and now Chuck is with the Chicago Bulls. I'll see Chuck Monday night. The Bulls are in town to play the Raptors. And uh, on top of that, I got hired to do a lot of college basketball games on television by different U.S. networks. So uh, in my first year, I was really busy. And uh, you know what? I had a good time with it. And I really enjoyed it. And, uh, you know, there were opportunities to get back into coaching right away. Uh, and a lot of my coaching friends were like, hey, man, you're having a great time doing what you're doing. Give it another year. See where this goes. You could always go back to coaching. And, uh, I, you know, it just kept developing. And uh, I kept working. At it. I'm not, not going to kid you. I worked my tail off at it. I spent a lot of time. You know, when you change careers, you really got to go all in. And I did. And yet I always had it in my back of my mind that I wanted to coach again. Uh, but I, I, I really dedicated myself to it and spent a lot of time uh, talking to other analysts and really studying other analysts, not just in basketball, but all sports, uh, to try to really develop uh, as an analyst. And uh, that, that to me is really important. No, you, you mentioned how you forgot 99.9% .9 of the stuff you learned in grad school. I, I'm in grad school right now and I forgot 99.9% .9 of the stuff already. So you're, <laughs> you're, I get it. You're not too off it. base. You know <laughs> but that point, that point one percent still matters, though, and and <laughs> a lot of it just comes down to what the foundational core of who you are and what you're about. Uh, so uh, you know there were some good lessons I learned, uh, but I I would agree that you 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 forget most of it, but mm -hmm. there's still something that kind of gets <laughs> in your soul, gets in your gut, that drives you in whatever profession you're in, whether it be law, medicine, or communications or whatever, that uh, still helps you. Do you have a coaching itch at all anymore? Is there no. still, it's, it's completely Absolutely gone, not. washed Absolutely. through. Uh, I mean, I've been out, this is my 24th year out. Yeah. Uh, I mean, this is my 24th season with the Raptors. And, uh, you know, coaching seems like a lifetime ago. It, literally, I was at the Buffalo Sports Hall of Fame dinner uh, last week and John Beeline, uh, who I coached against a lot, when he was the head coach at Canisius and I was the head coach at Niagara and John obviously went on to great fame as the head coach at university of Michigan, going to two national championship games. And uh, he's now with the Detroit Pistons. Uh, you know, I, you know, we, we were just laughing and reminiscing about different things. And, uh, but it, it, to me, it's a lifetime ago. I mean, I have a lot, a lot of friends that are in the coaching business uh, and, and I, I enjoyed my time in it. I loved it. Uh, but it's really, really hard, too. And uh, it, puts, it puts a lot of stress and strain on your family. Uh, you know, so to me, I've had a great time doing what I'm doing. I'm around coaches, players, uh, broadcasters, uh, scouts, executives, referees, you name it. So I get my basketball fix every day and yet I get in my car and it's not my problem after the game ends, you know, like, it, uh, and, and it's a very stressful life. So I have a ton of respect uh, for not only basketball coaches, but football coaches and baseball managers and hockey coaches and soccer and you name it. It's a hard life. And, uh, you know, coaching today's athlete is that much more challenging with uh, social media and, the pressure to be a division one athlete, the pressure to be a professional athlete, the amount of money, the amount of scrutiny. It's a hard business. Mm -hmm. Drake frequents the broadcasts. I think he did one in the preseason as well. And you've received many invitations during, <laughs> during broadcasts. Have you ever taken him up on one of them or are these, are these fake invites or these empty invitations? Well, uh, it, it's kind of, I, I wouldn't say they're fake or empty at all. Uh, you know, like I saw Drake the other night, opening night against Washington. Uh, a lot of it is the fact that uh, he's getting pulled in a million different directions <laughs> and I'm getting pulled maybe in two or three. 
but you see each other, you, you chat for 20 seconds and then you're gone. Yeah. Um, but no, I, I, you know, it, it's interesting. Every time I see him, I have a really good chat with him. He's a real, he's really into it. Yeah. And he educates himself. He follows it. He's come up to me a few times and said, you know, Hey, I was traveling and I, I got your game on the, uh, you know, the digital NBA <laughs> league pass or whatever. And you said something the other night about this, you know, what did you mean by like, so he's, he's into it, yeah. you know, like he's really into it. So uh, I, I enjoy his company. I think he enjoys mine. We have a lot of laughs. Uh, and the thing I like about Drake is that you can bust his chops. He busts yours. Yeah. <laughs> he's got a, he's got a twinkle in his eye. He's very funny. Uh, I like that. I like that. He's really smart. And, uh, you know, obviously his music speaks for itself and all that. But to me, I, uh, I, I just, I like him because he gets it. He understands it's show business. Uh, it's, it's entertainment. And uh, he's a smart guy. And uh, not only that, he's, uh, he's very gifted and very talented. Uh, but he also is, is, is he, he understands it's fun. And uh, so to me, I enjoy it. And, and uh, uh, I, I like people like that. I like people with soul. I like people with energy and uh, they don't, they take themselves seriously, but not too seriously. Right. And uh, I like that about. Do you, do you have any uh, memory, favorite memory that sticks out in particular with Jake? Uh, whew, uh, there's been a lot. Uh, you know, we've had a lot of laughs on the, I mean, I remember one time, uh, we, uh, during, I think it was probably the year it was Kawhi was with the Raptors. ESPN was in town to do the, uh, game as well. And he went on the air with them first and then came on the air with us second. So the minute he got on the air, I started busting his chops. I'm like, <laughs> Hey, big, hey, Mr. Big Shot, you host the ESPYs, but didn't, aren't you born in Canada? Aren't you Canadian? And you're going on the. U.S. network first before you come on with us schleps here on TSN. So, uh, so he he right he, he got it right away. Like bang, we're going at it then, you know. Uh, but that's what I like about him, that you can uh, you can have fun with him. Uh, I, again, I just think that he he has a a good sense of the fact that uh, you know I mean he's living his joy, his passion of music. I'm living mine. So I like being around people that uh, enjoy it and have fun with it. Uh, you know, it's interesting. I was listening to an interview, uh, you know, Howard Stern had Mick Jagger on. And to sit and listen to them chat, I mean, these are both icons in their business. Uh, it's really cool because you can hear the enthusiasm and the passion about uh, music and the mutual interests that come out. Uh, it's really cool to listen to. It's fascinating stuff. So I like being around people that have that love affair, you know, like that really, really love what they do for a living. Let's, let's fire off a few uh, quick Raptors questions. The first one that comes to mind is uh, what was your first reaction uh Number four pick is in, and it's Scotty Barnes, not Jalen Suggs. Well, I, I like Jalen Suggs a lot at Gonzaga. Uh, I, I, I liked Scotty Barnes a lot at Florida State. I think we were all more familiar with Jalen Suggs because mm -hmm. of the success that Gonzaga had going deep in the tournament. Nonetheless, I have great respect uh, for the basketball acumen and judgment of Masai Ujiri, Bobby Webster, Dan Tolzman, Teresa Resch, and, and their whole crew. Uh, they're good basketball people, mm -hmm. and they're good judges of talent. They're good judges of character. They're good judges of kind of what they want. And to me, uh, I think as a, a scout, as an executive, I, I mean, I did it for a living as a Division One coach for 14 years. Your job is to project out one year, three years, five years, and say, where is this kid going to be at? Where is this young man going to be at down the road? It's not the player now. It's what the player can be down the road. And, you know, when I look at a Scotty Barnes, 
And now having sat and watched him at practice in training camp and to watch him in games in person in preseason and now regular season, I totally get now why they were infatuated with him Mm -hmm. and that his upside. I think he's got major upside. It's going to take time. Yeah. It's not going to be a ready-made product and people have to be patient. He's going to have growing pains, no doubt. But I'm also intrigued and enjoy already watching him play because he knows how to play. He handles the ball. He sees the floor. He understands team basketball. He's got the length and quickness to, to be a good defensive player. Uh, you know, and again, he's going to have nights where he totally looks like a rookie, but I, I like the fact that they're going to throw him to the wolves and throw him in the deep end and, and uh, get him to pick it out, pick it up quick. And, um, uh, but uh, he's, I think he's got a chance to be a, a really good player. Yeah, no, I, I share the same sentiment as you that you were speaking on in the beginning. Like the number four picks in it's Scotty Barnes. And my very, very first reaction was what? My second reaction, point one seconds later, was Messiah knows what he's doing. Like this guy's going to be a stud. So I, I, I shared that, uh, that respect for the, for the decision makers there. Um, before we wrap up, what are the reasonable expectations for the Raptors this season? Should we be hitting the panic button after the Washington game the other night? Or where do you see them? What's successful season in your eyes? Well, panic button, absolutely not. It's funny. Uh, I was laughing. Uh, the Lakers lost opening night. And there were already articles about the fact of, you know, should there be panic in, uh, in L.A.? Uh, they have 81 games left. <laughs> I mean, uh, I don't think there's any reason to panic. Uh, I think too often now the society we live in that's so headline driven and so uh, Twitter, uh, Instagram, whatever the other things are uh, driven and people get too caught up in the headline and not the substance. So, uh, they're gonna are they gonna be bumpy roads? Yes, definitely. Uh, that's expected. So if you know that going in, what's the reason for panic when you knew going in it was gonna be uh, twists and turns, ups and downs, bumpy roads occasionally, but also a lot of bright spots too. So to me, I that's all part of it. Um, and I think that that's the danger uh, and the challenge for owners and executives. And even coaches that you don't uh, react to the reactionary nature of uh, the fact that, you know, you lost the game and and the sky is falling. The sky isn't falling. The sun comes up the next morning and you get back to work. And uh, the better organizations, the better coaches figure out how to navigate the challenges and get better from it. So, yeah, they got exposed. They struggled in game one against Washington. That's okay. Uh, They got Boston tonight as we, you know, tonight, uh, if we're on taping this on Friday, October 22nd, Mm -hmm. and they got Dallas tomorrow night. And then they got uh, Chicago on Monday and they got Indiana on Wednesday. It never, (laughs) ever ends. So uh, I try to look at it in, you know, five game segments, 10 game segments, 20 game segments to see kind of where you are, where you need to go. So, Yes, without Pascal Siakam, uh, there'll be some challenges. Uh, you have a youngish, younger type roster. I thought they played way too fast and way too frenetic opening night. I think they tried too hard. Mm-hmm. Uh, they were too keyed up, which is okay. It's going to happen. Uh, but I think over a course of five games, 10 games, 20 games, you'll have a better see- read of it. Uh, is this a championship team right now? No. Uh, can they be a team that competes for a playoff spot? Yes. Uh, but there are going to be nights where they don't look like that. And then there'll be other nights where they do. And I think as long as uh, we keep a, an even keel about it, um, and I think Masai Ujiri has been very upfront about kind of this is more about development and growth and uh, kind of restructuring, rebooting. Um, but I think they'll be competitive. And I think they'll be very entertaining and exciting. And they got a heck of a coach in Nick Nurse, who in time will get this group to figure out how to play. The, the, I said this on the air on Wednesday night, though. Andrew, this is the toughest style of play to play because uh, it's got to be maximum effort every night. 
They got to be flying around the gym. They got to be playing with a lot, a lot of heart and energy and grit. And uh, there are going to be nights where uh, oh, the, the schedule gets them, where there's just too many games in a short period of time and fatigue sets in and you got to go deeper in your bench. And the deeper you go in your bench, uh, the more volatility. Some nights the guy will come in and play great. Other night he'll be throwing the ball over the gym. Uh, you know, I've always been a big believer is less is more. The more guys you play, the more uh, chance there are to, you know, when your secondary lesser players come in, that more mistakes. On the other hand, when you play the way they need to play, uh, you need to have depth and you need to have energy all the time. And a lot of times that overcomes some of the issues that you're going to have. So uh, I think there'll be a team that uh, plays, their defense will be their base. Uh, they got to create turnovers. They got to create pace of play. They got to play with tons of energy and effort. And if they do that, then things start to come together for them. I agree. I'm excited to see where this season goes. Jack, I want to thank you so, so much for your time. You've been super generous with your time. So um, let's touch base again next year. See how they're doing next year. How about that, huh? Thanks, Andrew. And enjoy the game. Uh, I know you'll be sitting at a 200 yes. level yeah. for the... Uh, yeah, expect uh, the airdrop. It's all right. You're big time. At least you're in the building. That's okay. And uh, yeah. good luck. Good luck with law school. And always remember this. The only good lawyer is my lawyer, right? <laughs> well, I can't wait to be your lawyer then, Jack. <laughs> <laughs> See you guys. Thank you.